okay uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, under what conditions or at least for convex problems under what conditions there are there is no duality gap uh, but before I do that I just want to uh, go over the branch and bound method once more and tell you two specific methods to find the lower bound. So one was what we covered in the previous class, which is uh, uh, which is using the dual program, which is a convex program. But there are other methods also to uh, compute a lower bound to an optimal value of a function. So let's say you have a bunch of points. And you have a linear or a linear or a, a linear function that you want to minimize over this bunch of points. How can you find a lower bound to the optimal cost for this particular problem? What would be a way to get a lower bound? So of course, using dual is one way, but dual is of course problematic because you have to solve an optimization problem which is slightly more complicated. So is there a way to uh, to get this uh, lower bound on this optimization problem? So again, my problem is I want to minimize fx such that x is in capital X, gx is less than or equal to 0. And the problem is that x is discrete set. And I want to find a lower bound. Uh, to the optimal value, some lower bound. So one easy idea is that I draw a convex set so that all the points are within the convex set itself, okay? And I try to minimize the function over that convex set. So your f star would become min of fx such that gx less than or equal to 0 and x is in some set x tilde which is which contains the convex combination of the points in x okay so that's one way to get a lower bound which is which is uh, which may be somewhat simpler. So let me give you an example. If your x was 0, 1 raised to n, I can define my x tilde as 0, 1 raised to n. Okay. Okay, so this is one way by expanding the set. The other way could be that you have a non-convex function that looks like this over a convex set. And the other way to get a lower bound is to draw a convex function which is strictly below the original objective function and solve for the minimum of this particular convex function. That gives you a lower bound to the uh, to the optimal value of the original optimization problem. Okay, so why are we worried about the lower bound? Because it's useful for branch and bound method, as we had mentioned, we had talked about in the previous class. So we have identified three methods for branch and bound. One is three methods for bounding, getting a lower bound to the optimal value. One is to expand the set itself. The other is to change the function that you started with. Uh, and the third one is to use the dual program and compute the optimal value or some approximately optimal value of the dual program to get a lower bound on the, uh, on the optimal value of a function over some set. And once you do that, then you can apply the branch and bound method 
start with some set x, split it into x1 and x2 and uh, check if a lower bound on set 1, so you have to get a lower bound and you have to get an upper bound, you have to get a lower bound and you have to get a upper bound and then you have to discard xi if when should I discard xi if f lower bound i no yeah, f lower bound i is greater than f upper bound j. j not equal to y. Okay, this is the underlying branch and bound technique. It can take many, many steps before you, ab you are able to figure out what's the right splitting between x1 and x2 is. Um, so therefore, the runtime of this algorithm is not really very good uh, theoretically, but in practice, it works very well. So theoretically, whenever you are talking about the complexity of an algorithm, you always talk about the worst case complexity, but in practice, you never attain that worst case instance of the problem. So therefore, in practice, some of these algorithms work very well. OK. Any questions so far? Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but two is two is common. Why would you divide it into three three parts? So the assumption I'm making is that finding uh, the lower bound and upper bound on smaller uh, sets would be faster than. Uh, I see. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and how will you discard two sets? I mean, then you have to discard two sets out of three sets. I mean, maybe you can come up with a variant of branch and bound, but the question is whether it will strictly run better than this algorithm or not. Maybe it will. For some problems, maybe it will not. I don't know. Okay. Yes. As a derivative free optimizer, so there is, uh, no, we require derivatives to, ex I mean, uh, this is a general, let's say, philosophy for solving problems of this type. Uh, yes, it will work for derivative free, but it is usually used for integer optimization problems uh, or mixed integer problems uh, where sets are like this, but then you change it to a set that looks something like this to get a lower bound to the f star. So, uh, what is the difference between these two? This is 0, 1, the discrete 2 point, 0, 1 raised to n. This is the closed interval 0, 1 raised to n. So this is easier to solve. This is way more difficult to solve. OK. So yeah. So we talked about three bounding techniques. So upper bound is easy to get. It's the lower bound that's problematic. So we have talked about three ways to get lower bound. One is expand the set. Second is transform the function itself. And the third one would be to uh, use the dual, uh, the dual optimization problem and use weak duality to get a lower bound. OK. <coughs> so
So today our goal is to show strong duality results. or convex problem. So the setting is as follows. I want to minimize a function fx. djx is less than equal to 0 for all j 1 to r. x lies in some convex set capital X. So all of these are convex function, convex function, convex set. So completely convex problem. And we make an assumption about Slater constraint qualification, which is very similar to the one we made for barrier method. There exists x bar in x such that dj x bar is less than 0 for all j. Okay. Now we need to show the theorem is uh, if uh, star, let me call it star, star holds, then Q star is equal to F star. and there exist mu star greater than equal to 0. So geometric multipliers exist and there is no duality gap. Okay, so what should be the picture? The picture is as follows. I have a gx on x-axis, fx on y-axis, and I have a set that looks something like this. And I want to show for this particular set S that I can draw a line, a hyperplane with normal mu star 1 so that the entire set S is in the positive half space. That's all I need to show. And the y-intercept is F star, the optimal value of the function. And throughout the discussion for geometric multiplier, we have assumed that F star exists and is finite. Okay. So we are not talking about ill post problem. Okay, so this is what we need to prove. How should we go about it? Let's observe one thing that happens for a convex problem. The set S need not be convex, okay? So we can't really use the idea of supporting hyperplane to um, we can't use the idea of supporting hyperplane at this particular point to keep S on one of the sides because it's not a convex set. You can only use supporting hyperplane if you have a convex set. So somehow we need to transform this set S in such a manner that it's a convex set 
And the supporting hyperplane for the convex set is also a supporting hyperplane for this set S itself. Okay. Again, I want to repeat what I'm saying. This S is non-convex, so I can't use supporting hyperplane theorem. So what I want to do is draw another set A. So this is my set A. So this A contains the set S itself. And the supporting hyperplane for A is also a supporting hyperplane for the set S. What is the set A? I'm going to define A as the set ZW such that there exists x so that gx is less than equal to z and fx is less than equal to w. And this set contains the set S itself. Okay, a new picture. This is my set capital S. The way I'm defining A is as follows. Some people are still writing, so. Okay, so the way I'm defining A is as follows. I pick a point in the set capital S. I draw a line, well, I, cre I, uh, I have this region, so I draw a line which is horizontal, I draw another line which is vertical, and I have the space which lies above this line as on the right side of the vertical line, and I'm taking the union of all such, all such uh, spaces. And that's my set A itself, the set A. So I pick the point of Z comma W such that there is, a, there is an X such that GX is less than equal to Z and FX is less than equal to W. So if I pick a point here, then there is a point G of X, F of X such that so this is my z and w. So such that g of x is less than or equal to z and f of x is less than or equal to w, okay? So that's how I uh, pick my point, uh, pick a point in the set A and it turns out that this set A is actually a convex set. Yes? Has to be than zero always here? Uh, no. So this here fx is less than zero. So uh, the set A can also have negative values. Negative. Yes, yes. Yes, and the set A is going to look like Okay, so the set S is moving upward, but the set A contains the entire, um, uh, this entire region. So it's almost flat from here, from the minimum point, so this is the point at which the minimum occurs, the line is almost flat, not almost flat, it is flat, um, all the way to infinity. Any other question? Should X line S? Sorry? Should X always 
in S. Yes, because we are picking, for every point in S, we are picking this uh, cone and we are taking the union of all such cones. So it yeah, automatically. Yeah, this is a result. This is. A, A is defined such that X lies in S. Uh, so A is defined as union of uh, Z comma W. I don't want to use Z comma W. Uh, let me use G X comma F X. Uh, of z comma w or I'm trying to think how should I how should I it's union of these cones so I need to call these cones something let me call this c of gx fx so it definitely includes s so by definition, S is a subset of the set A. Okay. Now there are a series of results that we need to prove in order to show that there is no duality gap and there exist geometric multipliers. So let me write that series of steps. So the first is A is convex. This is an exam question. The second is 0 f star lies in A. And is at the boundary. Boundary of A. So where is 0 f star? So this is where you have fx star dx star comma fx star, that's this point, and this point is 0 comma f star. <coughs> okay. So A is convex is very easy to prove, so I'm not going to prove that part. Uh, 0 f star is at the bound is is within a and is at the boundary of a that part is actually easy to prove uh, so let's zoom in at this particular point zero comma f star so if 0 comma f star was not at the boundary, then it means 0 comma f star minus epsilon is also within A, would also be in A. Uh, does that create a problem? Why would it create a problem? So first of all, let's see why 0 comma f star would be in A. So gx is less than or equal to 0, and fx is less than or equal to f star, right? So certainly there will be one point x, because that's at that particular point, you have the optimal solution. So definitely gx star would be less than or equal to 0, and fx star would be less than or equal to f star. It will actually be equal to f star. So definitely 0 comma f star would be in A. But why would 0 comma f star minus epsilon not be in A? Why should this point not be in A? Yeah. Uh, because if in S, like if it's a minimum point yes. on the axis. Yes. Then it has to be a horizontal right. plane. Right. But how would you show it? How would you argue it mathematically? He already said the answer, but I just want others to. Yeah. X, sorry? X is in A. And if X, F star minus F star 
is the optimal solution, then it's in X, but it's not in X. That's right. Uh, so it, what will it contradict? Uh, S is a subset of A. S is a subset of A. Uh, no, I mean, a, I can make A bigger. I can make A much, much bigger than the set S itself. So it's not contradicting that fact. It's contradicting something else. Uh, OK, so let's think about what it is contradicting. So I know that 0 comma gx star is less than or equal to 0, fx star is less than or equal to f star implies 0 comma f star lies in A. So fx star is actually equal to f star. So 0 comma f star lies in A. Now if I have a point, if let's say 0 comma f star minus epsilon lies in A, and this implies that there exists gx bar, which is less than or equal to 0, and fx bar, which is less than or equal to f star minus epsilon. Can this happen? The optimal solution, yeah. So fx bar cannot be less than the optimal value of the original optimization problem. This is f star. So f star is the minimum. So you can't have another point that is feasible and satisfies and has a value which is strictly less than the optimal value of the function. So it contradicts optimality. It contradicts optimality of f star, which implies that 0 comma f star is at the boundary. Any questions so far? So, so far what we have done is we have a set S, we have embedded it into a much larger convex set. And what we have shown is that the optimal point, at least the y-intercept of the hyperplane, uh, lies at the boundary of the set A. So if it is at the boundary, I can draw a hyperplane such that A is in the positive half space. So there exists, uh, let me write it formally. I need to erase something. No, I don't want to erase this. So there exists a supporting hyperplane such that beta mu or beta tilde mu tilde not equal to 0, 0 and beta tilde f star plus mu tilde transpose 0 is less than or equal to beta tilde w plus mu tilde transpose z for all w comma z in the set A.
this is part 3. Okay. So what we have is you can create a hyperplane such that the entire set A is in the positive half space and the line passes through F star 0. Okay, now uh, what do we need to show? What should be the next step? So we have shown that there is a hyperplane here which passes through zero F star. So let me draw a hyperplane. Looks something like this. Um, the problem is I don't know what the slope of this hyperplane is. I know it's a hyperplane, but I just don't know what the slope is. And what should the slope be? it should all be non-negative. The values of the slope of the hyperplane be non-negative. Because remember, we have, we want the normal to be equal to mu comma one, where mu is non-negative and one is zero. One is, of course, strictly positive. So we want to show that the coefficient of beta tilde is strictly positive, and this coefficient is non-negative. So that's what we need to show. So that's 4a beta tilde mu tilde is non-negative. 4b, beta tilde is strictly positive. Okay, so let's argue that these two statements. Okay, so I want to use this expression to show that let's say beta tilde is positive, which means I need to eliminate mu tilde from the expression. So what should I do? I'm going to pick a point zero comma F star plus epsilon. Okay, so this point is in A. If this point is in A, then it must satisfy the following condition. So zero comma F star plus epsilon is in A. This implies that beta tilde F star is less than or equal to beta tilde F star plus epsilon plus zero. Okay, because z is equal to zero. Okay, epsilon is a positive number. So this implies that beta tilde must necessarily be non-negative. Now epsilon ei comma f star is in A, this implies that, or F, epsilon ej, so this implies Sorry, so I pick W. Oh, this should be ZW. Okay. So Z is Z comes first and W comes second. Okay. Uh, 
So z is the x coordinate and w is the y coordinate. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I pick this point, which is in A. So this must satisfy this inequality. So this implies beta tilde is greater than zero. Then I pick a unit vector in jth direction, uh, multiplied by epsilon. Uh, Evalu and then the second component remains f star, and I can go through the same argument to show that mu j tilde is going to be strictly non-negative. So that proves part 4a. For b, I need to prove that beta tilde is strictly positive. How would I show that? So let's look at the assumptions. So far, we haven't used the fact uh, that we have assumed there is a point such that g, j x bar is strictly less than 0. OK, we haven't used it so far. And now is the point to use it to show that beta tilde is greater than 0. So this using Slater's condition. Um, what can I erase this side? Okay. So let me pick a point uh, Z equals to. gx bar, so this is strictly negative, and w equal to uh, should I pick f star or So I want this term to remain. Okay. W equals to fx bar. And I'm going to assume, so let if assume beta tilde is equal to zero. Okay? So I want to so I've shown that beta tilde is non-negative. I want to show that beta tilde is strictly positive. So let's assume, uh, by way of contradiction, that beta tilde is equal to 0. And I pick this point, z, which is equal to gx bar, which is strictly negative, and then w, which is equal to fx bar. Plug it in here, this expression. What do I get? 0 times f star plus 0 less than equal to 0 plus mu tilde transpose z. Which is equal to summation of mu j g j x bar. Okay, I'm just using this expression here. Yeah. Why is there a contradiction? Because the mu is not negative and g is negative. Yes. OK. So what's the contradiction here? So he's saying, Mubarak is saying, this is non-negative. This is greater than or equal to 0, because we have proved it in part 4a. And this is strictly negative, because we have made that assumption right here. This is strictly negative for all j. And this is non-negative for all j. But the whole sum is greater than or equal to 0. 
So I have a non-negative number multiplied by a negative number. I sum it all up. And this sum is greater than or equal to 0. When can that happen? When mu is identically 0. This implies that mu is equal to 0. So if beta tilde is equal to 0, then mu is equal mu tilde is equal to 0. But it's a contradiction to this fact that the hyperplane should have all at least some coefficient. It can't be a 0 hyperplane. That's not a hyperplane at all. So contradicts 3. Okay, any questions so far? Now five, I'm going to define mu star as mu tilde over beta tilde. And then of course, beta star will be equal to one. And the normal to hyperplane is mu star comma one. Mu star is non-negative because mu tilde is non-negative and beta tilde is strictly positive. So mu star is non-negative. So that's my geometric multiplier and there is no duality gap. Oh, I still need to show no duality gap part. So I'll show it in a bit, but that's my candidate um, candidate uh, geometric multiplier. Yes. So it means that there is a point in the set such that all the inequalities are strict in that set. Okay. So this, what does this preclude? So you can't have x greater than or equal to 0 and x1 less than or equal to 0. Okay, because you can't have a point. So you, this is a feasible set because uh, I just, I can pick x1 equal to 0 which satisfies both these conditions simultaneously. And I can pick the value of x2 to xn anything which is non-negative. Uh, but it doesn't satisfy this criterion because there is no point which is strictly in the interior which strictly satisfies this uh, inequality constraint. Okay, let's look at another example. x1 square is less than or equal to 0. Okay, again there is no point which satisfies this inequality in a strict manner. So we want to preclude such conditions because in those cases, geometric multipliers may not exist. And there could be a duality gap. There was another hand here. No? In this figure, it means that S must contain a point in this region, in the strictly negative region. You can't have a set S which just touches the y-axis and then be on this side. It has to have some points on this side. Okay. So I, I have to, I still have to prove this part, which is Q star is equal to F star. So let's prove that. So F star is equal to beta star f star plus or yeah so i am using this equality this equation again but now i have uh, i have divided by beta tilde throughout so i get f star is less than or equal to beta star w plus mu star transpose z for all 
z comma w in a so beta star is equal to 1 so let me just remove it okay so this implies that f star is less than equal to uh, f of x plus mu star transpose g of x for all x Because I can pick w to be equal to fx, I can pick z to be equal to gx, and I get this expression. Okay. So now I have a a constant which is less than equal to a function, so it must be less than equal to the infimum of that function over the set. What is this equal to? This is exactly the definition of Q mu star which is less than or equal to Q star because Q star is supremum over all such mu. Okay, so this is the way to show that there is no duality gap. So from weak duality theorem, we knew that Q star is less than or equal to F star and this is a strong duality theorem which says that f star is less than or equal to q star which implies that f star must be equal to q star which must be equal to q mu star. So there is equality throughout this expression and uh, that would imply that mu star the one that we found here is actually a geometric multiplier. Yes. How does the last argument came that uh, this one? Yeah. So from weak duality, we knew that Q star is less than or equal to F star. This is the weak duality theorem. Here we have proved that F star is less than or equal to Q star. So it must be true that F star is actually equal to Q star. That's the only way inequality would work in both direction. So if f star is equal to q star, then this is, you have equality here and you have equality here. And if you have equality here, then it means that q mu star is actually the supremum of the dual function over the set D. And so mu star is a geometric multiplier. Okay. This is just one of many strong duality theorems um, in the book. Um, so the book also contains strong duality for cases where you have linear inequality and equality constraints, a bunch of linear equality and inequality constraints plus some nonlinear constraints of this type. Uh, most of these proofs are fairly simple and it builds upon some of these arguments. Okay? So when you have a convex problem with linear equality constraints, linear inequality constraints, convex inequality constraints that satisfy Slater constraint qualification, uh, your life is fairly easy because in all those cases strong duality holds, which implies that the optimal primal solution, uh, the value of the optimal solution is the same as the value of the dual problem and you have uh, an existence of a geometric multiplier 
for that particular problem. OK? Yes? Uh, so strong duality only holds for convex problems, right? Uh, for convex, you have sufficiently general results. Uh, for non-convex problems, I don't quite know where strong duality would hold. But uh, that doesn't mean there may not be any such situation. Any other question? So let's try and uh, find the dual problem for linear programming problem. Uh, so what does the dual program for linear programming looks like? And from one of these strong duality results, we kind of know that for linear programs, uh, there is strong duality. So a linear program is C transpose x, ax equal to b, x greater than or equal to 0. Okay. This is x and rn. So I'm going to define the set capital X as x greater than or equal to 0. The Lagrangian for this problem is C transpose x plus lambda transpose. Let me write it as b minus ax. I think that leads to a nice looking solution. OK. So this is C minus A transpose lambda transpose x plus lambda transpose b. OK. So now we have the Lagrangian as a function of x and lambda. What is Q lambda? Q lambda is equal to inf x in capital X L of x comma lambda. OK, I want to take the inf of this affine function. So I'm going to split it into two situations. So c is greater than or equal to a transpose lambda, and c is less than, uh, or ci is less than a transpose lambda i. So this term could be a vector of non-negative numbers, or it could have a negative number. So this is vector of all non-negative numbers, or there is at least one negative number in this vector. So in this situation, when c is greater than a transpose lambda, or this term is non-negative, what would the infimum value be? It's just lambda transpose b. By picking x identically 0, uh, because x is supposed to be greater than or equal to 0, then I can pick the value of x identically 0, kill this term, all I'm left with is lambda transpose b, and that would be the minimum value. In this situation, what's the value? Have you read this stuff before? <laughs> no? <laughs> uh, I'll let the rest of the class catch up. OK. Um, so what's the value here? So there is one term in this vector which is negative. 
okay, just one term. I can pick x equal to positive infinity for that particular term, and then this term would become minus infinity plus some constant. So that's minus infinity. Okay. Now remember that my set D was such that lambda such that Q of lambda is greater than minus infinity. So which is same as saying that C is greater than or equal to A transpose lambda. So my dual problem, maximize Q, lab, well Q lambda is lambda transpose B such that A transpose lambda is less than or equal to C. Okay, that's the dual problem. Uh, lambda could be in R M. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, we are going to talk about dynamic optimization problems from the next class onwards. <laughs>